On my YouTube channel, I like to share accessible experiences and my personal journey living with blindness. Because frankly, growing up, I didn't have that kind of representation. I didn't have the kinds of information that I have today on how to live an accessible life. And I also just didn't have the community to connect with. And as of today, October 19th, 2021, I've had my YouTube channel for 15 years. Hey, my name is James Rath and I was born severely visually impaired or how some would define it as legally blind here in the United States, registered blind some places in Europe or just overall, I live with blindness. I live on the spectrum that is blindness, non-correctable vision. I can't just put on a pair of glasses, I can't just wear contacts, and suddenly things are in focus. It doesn't work like that. So this video is titled something along the lines of how I make YouTube videos, how I create, and I'm gonna share that with you. I'm going to tackle my history as well as what I currently use to create my content I'm also gonna answer questions that people had sent me through the YouTube community tab, Twitter, and Instagram stories. And we're gonna talk about what's next. Yep. When I was eight years old, I picked up my parents' camera, the one that they would use for filming family events, birthdays, or just memories. I picked it up, probably without permission, and I turned it on. For me, the most vision I have is a couple inches away from my left eye. So I looked through that viewfinder and suddenly the world that I knew, the world around me that was blurry and out of focus and in a constant state of vertigo, it became clear. Well, at least clearer. <laughs> suddenly I was able to focus and zoom in on things even though the screen was only an inch away from my eye, I could begin to see detail that was several yards away. But that wasn't even the coolest part about a camera. The coolest part was being able to record. And then when I put in a tape into a VCR, feeling old, uh, I could watch it on a much larger display. I could play it back and suddenly details that I missed the first couple times are, are just becoming more and more into view. And growing up, I always loved being creative. I loved telling stories, making drawings or comics or any way to tell a story or to get something that was in my head into something that was shareable to other people. And whether it was just through performing or through drawing art. Look at I got! Uh, you got an art set too. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Eventually filmmaking became that medium for me. Being able to tell stories and capture it in a medium that brought the world just a little bit more into focus for me. More than I had ever experienced. And to this day, I still consider the camera the most accessible tool that I've ever been introduced to. It's been 15 years since I created this YouTube channel. 15 years. I was 10 years old when my uncle introduced me to YouTube and helped me sign up for an account. And YouTube is really empowered me to share my story, to be the representation that I didn't have and connect with others who are doing the exact same thing and different things and different genres. And it's just been an amazing ride. YouTube hasn't ever been a end all be all for me. It hasn't ever been my number one you know, income, but it's always been that place where I can just create. Anytime that I've gotten a paid opportunity for freelancing or to create for someone else, it's always been thanks to the same root. And that credit goes to my YouTube channel, to this place where I've been able to just 
broadcast to myself. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to anyone who's ever just watched through and enjoyed or shared or even just hit the like button or left a comment. And for those who've ever participated in a video of mine, who've ever I've collaborated with or has ever even just been in some of my early short films as cringy or awkward or whatever, thank you. Thank you for helping me to work on this collaborative medium. There's a lot that I can do independently, a lot that I've learned, but it really is a collaborative medium. Everything that I've ever done has been just leading up to building my craft. So simply, again, thank you. So I managed to recover some of the tapes that I shot back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, are you taping? Yeah. You're gonna put that up on uh, MySpace? Uh, I'm gonna break it, like, in the parts, though. You can edit it. Oh, yeah, wait. That's YouTube. You, you, you've got, um... You can have that two hours. You have that movie maker, right? And that was a, a Christmas where I even kind of vlogged, uh, which is so weird to think. In 2006, Christmas, I was, I was vlogging. I managed to track down a working version of that camera, as well as a battery and charger, which, let me tell you, is very hard to come by, at least for a decent price. And I managed to track one down, I got it sent, and this was my experience unboxing it and looking at that tape for the first time in probably 15 years. The original camera that I had, uh, I was a kid, I was a <laughs> reckless, immature kid. And I just, I, after filming with some friends one day, I left it outside, lived on the East Coast where uh, it happens to rain two, three, four times a week. It got wet. Water damaged. Man. So we've got the AC adapter. There's the battery. Oh man. That's, something sounds loose in it. I don't know how to feel about that, but hey, hopefully it works. So, oh my gosh. This was it. This was my very first camcorder. I had a fixed lens on it, of course. This was like a consumer camcorder. Didn't shoot HD. Oh my gosh. I just realized. I mean, I knew at the time, but it flipped all the way back. This was like ready for vlogging. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Onboard mic, flat. So you had all these like media controls in here, some function keys. This is already taking me back. Oh my gosh. This is, I'm, I'm just in awe right now. See, I don't know how long these like motorized little mini DV VCRs are going to last, but I got it up, it's running. I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm, oh, I think I got it right. Okay, so the front of the tape, it's basically like the tape goes in upside down, front of the tape is facing outwards. Okay, so I push this in. Going in, oh my gosh. I'm like, I'm trying to just process, like, this might actually happen. I'm excited, but I'm also nervous. I'm very nervous. It wasn't as easy as just scrubbing <laughs> through a video. But, all right, I think it's wrapped up. We're gonna hit play. You're gonna put that up on uh, MySpace? Am I gonna put this up on MySpace? I even mentioned YouTube in this. <laughs> Windows Movie Maker. And eventually YouTube just became a home and a platform for me to share myself, my stories. So autofocus is a big part of my workflow. It's a big part of when I'm producing things independently. iPhones have great autofocus. My Sony ZV-1, incredible autofocus. So that's a big thing for me. So I also received some questions about my YouTube journey and my process. I wanna answer those, so let's go do that. Going to wear my sunglasses for this part, just because these lights are getting a bit bright and I want to conserve my eyes for the rest of this filming as well as editing because I'm on a deadline. First, let's start with the YouTube community tab. It feels a little fitting. I'm gonna make use of the live text feature. How has documenting your journey helped you? Steve Evans. I would just say a couple aspects. First off, the monetization of it where 
just by documenting my experiences with blindness and, and accessibility, I've been able to get jobs, as I've pretty much explained, uh, and, and help leave a footprint and, a, and sort of a impact on different industries that you know, I'm passionate about, products that I personally use or consume. Personally, it's also allowed me to just watch my growth play back that growth that I've had over the last few years. When I even look back at videos that I made in high school, I identified as visually impaired. I didn't ever use the term blindness or blind or legally blind. And I was corrected by my own ophthalmologist where she clarified to me like, no, you are legally blind. You fall under the spectrum of blindness, the definition of someone who lives with blindness or is considered blind by medical professionals or the government for you know qualification of services or accommodations things like that reaching out to more community and stuff and, and I, I realize yeah no I'm not just visually impaired and visually impaired is still a valid label for someone with a visual impairment but I do have this different sort of non-correctable degree of blindness that you know not everyone who's considered visually impaired hits that threshold Terry maximum effort five hours ago what advice do you have for anyone who wants to start making videos what advice do you have about being disabled and making videos is upfront honesty ideal trying to decide what to do in the future with limited options and streaming and making videos could be a viable option to have contact with the outside world and potentially even make a little money so terry thank you for your question again i don't have all the answers and i know it is really going to be a different experience for everyone for me I, i've always just been passionate about filmmaking, video, content creation, and I always knew I wanted to make it a career or at least implement it into, you know, my, my career. But I know a lot of people who just do it for that connection, do it for that community. And you know, if things take off, it takes off. I would say it's like, do it because either you're passionate about the message or the, the story or, or what it, whatever it may be that you want to share. And, video is just a medium you don't have to be passionate about video production or editing but if you're just passionate about whatever substance you're creating about i think that's all that matters and that will show my first videos were terrible i think any youtuber's first <laughs> videos were terrible on camera you're probably not going to be as comfortable if you haven't done it hundreds of thousands of times i'm going to check out my instagram responses now best tips tricks for someone getting into video editing while visually impaired so some tips and tricks I have for video editing. Uh, it, I mean, first off, just practice. Feel free to like make stuff that you never actually share. I work on little silly videos occasionally just to try out uh, new techniques or to play with things like sound design. I would start with, if you're visually impaired with, again, finding a platform that is preferred with your accessibility. It could be Windows, it could be uh, Android, it could be Mac or iOS, right? So. Figure out what you prefer. Have there been times where you wanted to stop posting on YouTube? Oh man, have I ever wanted to stop posting on YouTube? I don't think so. I've sure gone through periods of just not creating or being in a funk, but I'd say no. Like I've always wanted to just keep creating and posting to platforms like YouTube. Who are your favorite collaborations? Okay, so what are my favorite collaborations? This is really tough. And I don't want to say this is like my favorite, because honestly, every time I get to work with someone, it's it's an amazing opportunity and time because all the people who I've been able to collaborate with have been able to just like inspire and motivate me creatively. I will say though, one of the coolest things, and just cause it's kind of relevant with this being like my 15 year YouTube anniversary, one of the earliest creators I came across was actually I Justine and this was like her iPhone AT&T bill video. And even before that, she was making like videos in an Apple store dancing. And I don't mean to like call her out or put her on the spot or anything, but I've watched for a long time and been able to be creatively inspired by, as I grew up learning how to make videos online for YouTube. And to now like have a friendship and, and been able to collaborate and meet up at like events, it's really cool so Justine just like shout out to you and of course there's just been numerous 
collaborations I've been able to have with like my friends Ricky Pointer, Steve Saylor, Molly Burke. It's a tough one. Everyone's my favorite. Moving over to the Twitter questions. Stefan, an Apple sheep that loves tech too much. And Steph Engsman, replying to at James Rath. How long was it until your channel go monetized? One day ago, one like. So the story of how my channel got monetized is actually, it's a little interesting. YouTube partner program used to be a lot different. Like it was something you had to apply for and more times than likely you were probably rejected if you didn't have a strong subscriber base or viewership. And I would say in 2012, 2013, sometime around then is when I actually got into the partner program. And this was like only maybe half a year or a year before uh, it fully kind of shut down and anyone could really monetize as long as you hit certain uh, thresholds. You know, it just kind of got revamped. I think it's gotten revamped again. This was back when you could like have your own banner with clickable links and stuff and fully customize your channel. I actually got to do that for a little bit before the redesign. That was when I had like less than 2000 subscribers, like very early for my channel when I was just really using it as a portfolio, as a playground to make content. Uh, and that only came from the fact that I won some kind of contest where a YouTube rep reached out to me asking if I'd like to be monetized. Uh, and that was because Ryan Higa, uh, Niga Higa, creators like Dietrich and Andrew Garcia, and Timothy Delegato, they were kind of going on tour, a few other folks, and I won some video contest to meet them and hang out backstage and uh, that was in New York. I was like 16 years old at the time. So being able to like experience that and meeting like some of my favorite YouTube content creators was just really cool. It was inspiring. And then suddenly a Google employee emailed me and was like, hey, do you want to be a part of the partner program? Congrats on that video competition with Ryan Higa. I'm like, thanks. Yeah, sure. That's how my channel got monetized. Stefan, an apple sheep that loves tech too much. And Steph Engspin, replying to at James Rath. What are some tips for someone who is trying to gain subscribers, but just isn't? One day ago, one like. So to be honest, subscribers really don't matter as much as they used to. It does still help and it, uh, it keeps an audience, I think, engaged, or at least, you know, it gives you the data and, and information that people want to keep coming back. But it's pretty much all about retention. It's about click-through rates. It's it's how long people are watching and how long did people stay on the platform after watching your video. I'm really not the best person to probably give this advice because I have like under 27,000 subscribers and that never has really again mattered to me. It's always just been about the content. It's been about the uh, engagement, the comments and the opportunities that come from creating these YouTube videos. Now, I'm gonna try and figure things out personally Moving forward. Grant Stoner at SuperCrypt1994. Verify. Replying to at James Rath. Tell me about Pokemon. One day ago, one reply. Tell you about Pokemon. I'm sure I have one or two on the shelf behind me. Actually, there's a lot more probably just out of frame. Ditto and intern Pikachu. <laughs> Pokemon has always been like a, uh, a hobby. It's been an accessible game for me to play growing up. And fun fact, I actually had an entire YouTube channel dedicated to Pokemon. That's as much as I'll really say. This was back when I was between the ages of 11 to 13 before I really started focusing things on this channel. I made very niche Pokemon gameplay content and even beyond the game stuff. And I, I wish I still had those, but I was 12, 13, I, did, I didn't back things up. Isaac McBurney at Isaac M3, replying to at James Rath. If you didn't make YouTube videos, where do you think you would be today? So if I wasn't making YouTube videos, where would I be today? I think I'd probably be doing something still creative, but maybe in, in marketing and communications, possibly. YouTube was part of my whole filmmaking career and path. I mean, it's one thing if I got into filmmaking two decades ago, right? Probably would have been very different too as a legally blind filmmaker two decades ago. I, I don't know if what kind of opportunities would have been able to be like self-made. I, I gotta say marketing communications probably, but I'm I'm also glad I stuck with this and, and freelancing because I got a really cool opportunity happening right now behind the scenes that I'm, I'm working on and I can't wait to share more with you and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Oh, uh -oh. Like a diamond in 
So that is a little look into my process with creating videos. And I wanna talk about what's next. I've been making videos on and off for the last 15 years. When I say on and off, it's like, I'm still working on videos typically, but there's been some spacing in between videos, right? I, I could go almost a month. In the past, I'm sure there's been a few months where there was no upload. And I want to do less of that. And I'm sure I've said that before, but I really do wanna work on continuous content. Uh, recently, I've been taking Matt Diabello's uh, master YouTube class. It's been great. It's, it's a little bit of a process, of course, absorbing all this information and implementing some tactics and strategies into the content. So that's gonna be an ongoing process and implementation, but at the same time, outside of freelancing work, I've also been working on my next major project. The next big thing that I've been kind of dreaming about making for some time. And I can't share those details in full yet, but I'm gonna bring you along for that journey. I'm going to capture the process of making this next project as I get closer to that process. Um, things are moving along. It's just a lot of prep work. I don't want the YouTube videos to stop or slow and I'll continuously be making original content here and things that I think uh, can provide value. I'm also starting my podcast back up again. I took a few months off just because I was working on a lot of the prep work for this project. But the See Different Show, my podcast where I'm talking with influential people in the space of accessibility, it's like 45 minute to hour long conversations, that's going to continue. I know this video was certainly a little bit more personal, but I hope you were able to get some insight into my journey and my process with creating YouTube videos and what my plans are moving forward. I would love to hear from you. How has the platform of YouTube or just online video, how has that changed your life? Maybe for better or for worse, but I'd rather you try to keep it a little bit positive. Uh, let me know, how has, uh, how has this impacted you? And with that, I hope that you could see different today. I'll hear you next time. Bye.